Dr. Scott Sears from St. Vincent Healthcare. And Doc Sears, great to see you here in studio this morning. Yeah, so it's great to be here. The uh, the weather has just been incredible. I know across the state, Western Montana, you know, has had some great sunny weather as well. Uh, I was about to dance out of the sunroof driving across town over the weekend. It was so sunny. Yeah, it was it was beautiful. My family and I we went skiing up at Red Lodge Mountain, which was beautiful on Saturday. It was almost fifty degrees, no wind. First time I've been there in forever with no wind, and the snow was great. And there's a ton of people out there, so it was a lot of fun. Well, and, and that's the thing is. Even when it's crowded, if if the sun's out, you know, you're even if it's a long line at the lift, hey, it's at least the sun's out. Sun's out, guns out, right? That's <laughs> right. And long lines in Montana are still super short compared to Colorado and the rest of the world. That's so. true. That's for sure. Well, what do you want to talk about today? I know you've been fielding some questions at you know at at the hospital uh, for the past couple of weeks. What are some of the big questions you've? Yeah, been I think some of the some of the great things we can talk about today that are really pertinent to a lot of people out there is is what we call reflux disease that most people commonly refer to as heartburn. And I think it's really important to understand that there's a lot of symptoms of reflux disease that aren't necessarily just heartburn. So people focus on heartburn and the purple pill. There's a lot of other diseases that can be caused to, and this is Heart Health Awareness Month because it's February. Um, and we talk about that. I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, some great success stories, particularly over here in the Laurel Billings area. And St. Vincent was recently accredited as an official chest pain accreditation center by the American College of Cardiology, which is a huge accomplishment. There's only two places in the state of Montana who have risen to that level of accreditation. Uh, actively saving lives. I have a great success story from the last couple of weeks that we did there that we definitely can touch on. And as always, you know, fielding any questions that people have. A question from the Disney's in Libby, Montana. Uh, some news says that the Chinese coronavirus is much more deadly than seasonal flu, as high as 19% more. Is this true? There seems to be conflicting opinions on this matter. What are you hearing? Yeah, I mean, it definitely is more deadly than the flu, but it depends on what you mean by that. Which, which If you get coronavirus, there is about right now a 2 to 4% mortality, which means 2 to 4% of the people that are actively getting this new coronavirus are dying. The mortality rate for flu is much, much, much lower. Right? So your risk of dying from influenza is a lot lower relative to coronavirus. However, influenza is so much more prevalent, so many more people get it, that actually more people are dying from influenza, but a smaller proportion of people who get it. So, so you can hear people argue both ways when they say 19% more people dying. Well, yeah, if you got coronavirus versus flu, you would be more likely to die from that disease. But anybody walking around in, in Montana today is much more likely to die of influenza because you're more likely to get it. And even though the mortality rate is lower, you know, your risk of dying is higher because your risk of getting it is higher. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, and I, I saw in some of the national news today, you know, there's joint exercises that go on every spring in South Korea with the U.S. military and, and our South Korean friends. And, and uh, they're even looking at uh, changing, you know, shifting that around because of the threat of coronavirus and things like that. And I know some of the talk at the national level, too, is like they think that maybe this thing started in some lab in China <laughs> instead of in a market. But, you know, that's uh, we'll yeah, leave that to the international authorities to figure all that stuff. Out. And I think it is important for people that are planning international travel. I mean, obviously, you want to avoid China. Uh, South Korea has been, you know, it, it's been discouraged to travel there because of their outbreak. Um, Italy actually now is uh, having a little bit of an outbreak. And so uh, the travel societies have basically said you can still travel to Italy. Like if you have a cruise or a trip coming up, but you need to exercise significant caution. Make sure you're really aware of your surroundings, avoiding those who are sick or coughing, using common sense, which you should do everywhere. But but Italy is now on the radar as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we get into chest pains and heartburn and all that, oh, I got to give a shout out to the, uh, the IHOP folks. They got a big fundraiser going yeah. on at the IHOP. In Billings today, so they dropped off some omelets. This thing is gigantic. It's got like, looks like like shredded beef on top, <laughs> sausage lines. Like man, I think an omelet. An omelet is just a salad with eggs. It, right? I mean, right. You put anything in an omelet that you like to eat, and you can eat it. And it's protein too. Yeah. So that's that's good. Yeah, I like that. So anyway, so if I get a little distracted, if you hear me chomping <laughs> in the background, we'll just let Doc Sears take it all from here. Uh, I got a qu another email question from a listener. This was from Paul uh, during our last go around, but I didn't catch the email until after the show. He says, I'm getting testosterone pellets from my doctor every six months. They're having me take a product called DIM. It's supposed to be an estrogen blocker. It's not a prescription, but I'm wondering if you know about this product. Is it necessary? Yeah, so so two, two points that are really important here. Number one is we've talked on this show before about my feelings about testosterone pellets. Uh, testosterone pellets 
um, are being overused, just to be blunt about it. And, and I would be really cautious about using testosterone pellets without getting a second opinion from a board-certified endocrinologist about the indication for you getting testosterone. There is a lot of money exchanging hands for implantation of testosterone pellets in men or estrogen pellets in women right now. And it's not very well controlled, and people just really need to be cautious. There's been some very strong statements lately about inappropriate hormone use, which is testosterone and estrogen in men and women. It increases the risk of a lot of problems, heart attacks, prostate cancer, high cholesterol, um, estrogen obviously increasing the risk of breast cancer, strokes, uh, blood clots. So there's a lot of risks. And when you're getting testosterone pellets, the people selling the pellets and inserting the pellets are making money off of that. And so there's a little bit of a conflict of interest, in my opinion. So go to an independent doctor, <coughs> get a get second, a second opinion. opinion if you really have an indication that two people agree that you require hormone replacement therapy and that you understand all the risks associated with it, then okay. Um, but the pellets, you know, that's just one way of delivering the hormone. DIM, on the other hand, is a great question. DIM is not an estrogen blocker. So that, that's commonly reported. It doesn't really block estrogen. What, what DIM does is it's a chemical found in broccoli, Brussels sprouts. It's one of the chemicals that a lot of people think... Uh, are the reasons Brussels sprouts and broccoli are so good for you. And, and what they do is they're, they're kind of estrogen regulators. And so they block something called aromatase, which converts hormones into estrogen in the body. It also blocks the, te- the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. And so they're giving it to prevent the loss of testosterone turning into estrogen to augment the testosterone pellets. Interesting. Okay. Or you could just eat some broccoli. Is that you could idea? just eat some broccoli and Brussels sprouts. You know All my right. passion about fruits and vegetables. I actually <laughs> like broccoli and Brussels My wife makes some really good broccoli. Brussels, but even my mom was like, oh, I hate Brussels sprouts. She tried them. She's like, these are really good. Yeah, Doc, you were talking about how uh, St. Vincent Healthcare just recently got an accreditation uh, for a, a chest pain center. Huge deal. He said there's only two, basically, accreditations like this here in the state of Montana. Um, but, you know, speaking of chest pains, heart attacks, you name it, you, you had a, a guy walk into one of your, just your primary care clinics in Laurel, Montana, yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. share the story with us just because this is incredible uh, how yeah, quickly they responded. Just a fantastic story. Shows the quality of care that's going on around the state of Montana. But you have a primary care clinic that sits just one block north of, of Laurel High School uh, right there on the main street. It's great clinic, great physicians and providers that are there. Uh, gentlemen experienced chest pain. This is, again, Heart Health Awareness Month. Uh, experienced chest pain, figured I need to go in. I would recommend if you're really having crushing chest pain, pick up your phone and dial 911. All right, that's better. But but this person walked into our clinic, said I had chest pain. From the front desk staff all the way to the back, they immediately recognized this is a high-risk situation. Older gentleman having chest pain. Get him right into a room, immediately put 12 stickers on his chest and did an EKG. Saw he was actively having a heart attack. Within 16 minutes, he was at the door of St. Vincent Hospital. And instead of having to go into the emergency room because of these protocols of being a chest pain accreditation center and how smoothly what we call the cath lab works, this patient went straight into the heart cath lab. And cardiologists waiting, techs waiting, everybody waiting, prepped him, laid him on the table. His heart stopped five times. He had to be shocked with electricity five times in 16 minutes. But in that 16 minute period, they were able to thread a wire into his heart, find the blockage, see that it was 100% occluded to half of his heart, open it up with a balloon, restore 100% flow, and the guy walked out the next day. Unbelievable story about the coordination to, to think that in 16 minutes, you can go from being dead like his heart stopped five times, being dead to restoring 100% flow inside your heart because of how much behind the scenes work goes on to become, you know, a chest pain accreditation center that everybody's working on the same team, saving lives. Truly remarkable stories. Huge shout out to all the healthcare professionals out there from people who just work at the front desk and greet patients to people who accept the 911 calls and send ambulances to, to everybody, to the cardiologist who actually has the, the expertise and the skill to go in and open up a vessel like like that. That's remarkable. You talk about every person mattering every single step of the way. Yeah. Um, and, and they did all that. He walks out the next day and you didn't even have to open up his chest, huh? 
Exactly. They don't need bypass surgery. I mean, nowadays our cardiologists are so good. And now we were talking about this earlier. They, they used to go in through the groin all the time um, with these wires, but now our cardiologists are so good. I would say the majority of, of the procedures are just going in through the wrist, just wow. above your thumb. There's a little radial artery. Cardiologists are so good. They just numb up that artery. You're laying there on the table wide awake. They thread a wire up. They can go all the way to your heart, find the blood vessels. They inject a little bit of dye contrast in there so they can see where the blood glows and where the blockage is. And if the blockage is over a certain level, then they can use a little dilator, open that up, and then pop a little stent in there. And you don't need to crack your chest open. There are certain circumstances where that's still necessary. If it's like the main vessel coming off your aorta into your heart, that one oftentimes they'll bypass it. Or if you have multiple vessels, like they don't want to be putting four balloons in there. Like if you have that much disease, what they'll do is they'll just take a vein out of your leg and they'll just bypass the area that's blocked. And so you basically get a bypass vessel from your own body that goes around. And so great cardiothoracic surgeons that do that, incredibly skilled, working hand in hand with the cardiologist so that you get the right treatment at the right time. And then for you as the patient, are you, is it literally almost feel like you're just sitting there with an IV in your wrist? Yeah. Uh, and, and obviously it's a little nerve wracking, you know, because sure, they're talking yeah. and you can see on the TV, you know, what your heart vessel <laughs> looks like. And you're like, oh my gosh, there's a wire inside my heart. So people can get a little anxious and they use me- pain medicine to kind of alleviate any pain or discomfort people are having. Because a lot of times people are in there because they're having chest pain and that in and of itself is anxiety provoking. Right. And so um, this is a great, great heads up for everybody out there listening that, that you should not ignore chest pain. You know, I once had a urologist. This is a trained physician. I had a urologist come to me, not here, so not to you know call out any of our urologists, <laughs> but this is in Seattle. The urologist come to me saying, "Hey, Scott, I'm having this this chest pain. You know, every time I exercise and, and I run like a half a mile, and I get like this chest pain. So I sit down and it goes away, and then I start to run again. It comes back, and I sit down and it goes away." He says, I went to my, bu- I went to my partner and I'm like, what? Like, why would you go to your urology partner if you're having chest pain that goes away when you rest? I'm like, you got to get in to see a cardiologist and, and people should not ignore symptoms that either are chest pain or pressure or shortness of breath when they're exerting themselves that always comes that reproducibly. Seriously. Always, always talk to your primary care physician uh, or even call one of our heart clinics or cardiology clinics. They're so good. I had a patient come in just yesterday, well, actually just last week. He saw the cardiologist yesterday, came in and he'd been having some limiting symptoms, just more short of breath than usual when he went to the gym and he hadn't changed his workout. EKG looked normal. Blood test looked normal. Even did a stress test, it looked normal. And he and I both talked about it and said, you know what, this just isn't right. You know, and actually, so he is now going for a heart cath because symptoms speak more loudly than even testing. And so if people are having limiting symptoms with your workout, you really need to go talk to a physician and get in there before the big bad thing happens. Yeah, and some of this stuff is genetic too. So you may be in good shape, you may exercise, eat right and everything, but there's sometimes there's still just genetics and stuff happens. So yeah, I tell people all the time, there's, take there's symptoms serious. Yeah. four risk factors I can treat, right? Quit smoking, treat your cholesterol, treat your blood pressure, make sure you don't have diabetes or if you do, that is controlled. There's a bunch of risk factors I can't control. Your age, I can't do anything about that. Your genes, I can't do anything about that. And so you can have those other four controllable risk factors all really well controlled. But as you get older and you have genetics, you can still have a heart attack and you still need to pay attention to your symptoms. You can't just say, hey, because I'm a great athlete, I'm working out every day. I don't have to worry about this chest pain I'm having. Now, China may try to control those genes or (laughs) manipulate those genes, but that could have some other ramifications all in their own. So we won't get there yet today. But uh, speaking of, you know, chest pains, heartburn, acid reflux disease. Sometimes uh, heartburn may actually be a symptom of a heart attack too, right? So that's why you got to take heartburn pretty serious too. Absolutely. You know, heartburn is one of those things that people are used to using the word heartburn and they feel like heartburn is a burning where their heart is, usually in the center of the chest. And it is a burning if you've ever experienced it, which most people have doesn't feel good. You know, certain foods, tomato-based products, uh, alcohol, peppermint, spicy foods, Mexican food, they all can trigger increased acid production. And then if the stomach overproduces acid, it can actually go up into the esophagus. When the esophagus has acid in it, it hurts. I mean, it burns because the esophagus is not made to experience acid. The stomach is. The stomach's like a rubber, you know, container. Acid doesn't hurt it at all. But as soon as that acid goes up, it starts to cause serious damage. It can cause strictures, which makes it hard to swallow, it can eventually lead to esophageal cancer, but it also can cause problems that people aren't aware of. 
chronic coughing, hoarseness, because the acid can irritate the vocal cords. So if you have a chronic cough and you're not really sure why, it actually can be acid reflux even without heartburn. You were even saying it can affect your sinuses. Yeah, so people you, have chronic sinus absolutely. issues could I'd, be related to acid I've reflux I've had disease. several patients the last couple of weeks who come in and they think they have three different things. They're like, I have this cough that won't go away. I can't catch my breath. My sinus, I keep getting these sinus infections and I have heartburn. Why do I have so many things wrong with me? I'm like, you don't have so many things wrong with you. You have one thing wrong with you, and that is you're refluxing acid up the wrong direction. It's causing chest pain with heartburn. It's causing you to be having a cough, and it's causing you to have recurrent sinus infections because it's irritating the lining of your sinus. And a simple medication can treat acid <coughs> reflux disease, right? Yes, and 99% of the time, people don't need to go in and have a camera stuck down their esophagus. These pills are over the counter, but the, the Prilosec, Omeprazole, Nexium, all these purple pills, people can safely take one of those every day for 30 days. If that completely resolves your symptoms, you can quit taking it and you probably don't need to go in. If your symptoms aren't better after 30 days or they come back after 30 days, then we do recommend you come in. Or if you're having any red flag symptoms, meaning unintentional weight loss, vomiting, or blood in your stools, those you're not really allowed to go take those pills off the shelf. You really need to go talk to your doctor if you're having any of those symptoms. And that might be something more cancer related that, at that point. Yeah, then we worry about, yeah, actually you've had acid reflux long enough that the cells have actually changed and they're so inflamed that they can't either turn into cancer or people can have a condition that we call Barrett's esophagus, which is your esophagus cells turn into stomach cells oh, to wow. protect themselves from the acid. And if they turn into stomach cells, they have a much, much, much higher risk of turning into cancer cells. And so those patients, we actually do bring them in every one to three years and, and repeat like a, a camera. a scope or a scrape we do or whatever a, they no, call it? No, a scope. Or, they would yeah. put a camera down in the esophagus, look at the cells, take a biopsy, look at it under a microscope, make sure it's not changing. If people get esophageal cancer, and, and my heart goes out to those that have a family member with this, my, my cousin's husband died of esophageal cancer at 38. Um, it's very, very hard to treat because you can imagine you got to cut out a huge chunk of a very necessary organ and it spreads so quickly because there's so much blood supply. We definitely want to catch those things early. So if you, if you got acid reflux disease, you know, or other, these other things, it's just another reminder. Don't just sit and ah, I'll just deal with it. I'll just suck it up. Like, because literally it could be one thing, not three things like you mentioned. And it could maybe even be simply treated if you just... Absolutely. And here's, yeah. here's a real big take home for people. You should not have to take acid reflux pills continuously after 30 days for simple reflux. If you do need to keep taking them, then you need to talk to your doctor about it. All right. Are you excited about anything else in the healthcare arena that you've been reading? Anything, well, as you can tell, I'm excited about there. everything in the that's, healthcare that's right. arena. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. excited about everything in the healthcare arena. Um, there's so many cool things going on right now, you know, from just all the public awareness from coronavirus and how important simple things are, such as hand washing. I, I think it's so funny. You still go to airports and people are wearing masks all over. The only people that need to be wearing masks are people who actively have symptoms. If you're wearing a mask because someone else is sick around you, it's not protecting you because the way you're going to get the disease is secretions are going to get on your hands and you're going to touch your eyes or itch your nose or, or touch your mouth. The best thing you can do to prevent any kind of viral spread of illness is don't touch your face. And don't just, touch and wash your, your face. hands, right? Yeah, yeah. wash your hands yeah. all the time. Carry around the little alcohol sanitizer. You know, I think the awareness between coronavirus and influenza, get your vaccines, wash your hands, it's always and pay attention to people around you. It's always the worst when you're at like a, a public facility and you're in the restroom and it's like, that dude just walked out without <laughs> washing his hands. Like, come on, bro. What's your problem, man? You know, I would, do I got to start publicly shaming folks here or something? You know? Absolutely. Dr. Scott Sears, St. Vincent Healthcare. Always a pleasure. Great to see you. All right. Thanks.